We are going to begin the funeral service for Mr. Richard Mark Frankel. If you have a cell phone, I'd ask you kindly to place it in a silent mode or turn it completely off at this time. I'd also like to welcome, on behalf of the family, everybody uh, visiting us live stream, thank you very much. Services will be conducted by Rabbi Barry Schechter of Congregation Cole Emmett in Skokie. Miss Mole David, Adonai, Mi Yakubi Olecha, Mi Ishkon, Behar Kotchecha, Olech Tahamim, Ufahoy Lutzedek, Vidover Emmet Milvavo. Lo regale le shono, lo asol re hura. Lo cher pa lo nasa, al kero hava. Nivze be nav nimas, yet yere adonai chabed. Nish pa lo ra, velo yamir, kaspo. Lona Tambernashach, Vishokhad, Al Nakil Alakach. Al Seyla, Loimot Liaholam. God, who may abide in your house, who may dwell in your holy mountain, those who are upright, who do justly, who speak the truth within their hearts, who do not slander others or wrong them or bring shame upon them, who give their word and come what may do not retract, who do not exploit others. Those who live in this way shall never be shaken. Uh, dear friends, we're here for a, a sad and difficult occasion to say goodbye, which is one of the most difficult things that we can ever do, but also to pay tribute and to honor the memory and to celebrate the life of Richard, Richard Mark Frankel, the son of Stephen and Josephine, who's gone to his eternal rest and leaves behind a family and friends who loved him very, very dearly and whom he loved. First, I should mention his, his wife, Amal, his uh, siblings, Charles and Martha and her Michael, and uh, nephews, nieces, Melanie and her Adam, Eli and Talia, Molly and her Felipe and Saul, and the next generation, Mara Ruth, Owen, Isaac, Claude, and Faye. Are these, oh, uh, are these two, have I just mentioned them? You can take a bow. <laughs> well, I've spoken to you, about a few of you, actually, about Richard. You told me about his early life, going to New Trier, East, living in Monet, the Minetka. And then uh, his academic achievements, going to getting his bachelor's degree from American University in Washington, D.C., and then going to Johns Hopkins for his Ph.D. But I also heard about growing up. Uh, I know, uh, Charles, you told me that uh, when you were quite young, you, you played baseball, the two of you. But you also mentioned, and this was very important, the vacations that you took, which you described there were two types and one outstanding one. There was the small vacation. Um, that was to Glen Arbor. It was every other year. And then there was the big vacation, always driving, uh, national parks, 
Yellowstone, went to the West. He also went to New York and uh, Washington, D.C. He was staying in small hotels. But then, in 1960, you said there was a, a life-changing vacation. Stephen, your father, took a, 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 a sabbatical, and you took a train to New York, and you took a French liner across the ocean. You rented a car, and you traveled all over Europe. You have many and wonderful memories. Uh, you went to a lot of places, not to Germany, except to drive through Germany, and you met relatives all over the place, including in Britain, which makes me very pleased, and um, you uh, met relatives in, in France. Uh, these relatives, y you, you met relatives in, uh, in Holland. Uh, in fact, you couldn't really understand what they were saying, because they spoke German and Dutch, but not English. So your dad would converse with them in, in German. And some of these relatives would come here. And this was, a, this was an eye-opening experience for all of you. Now, as I said, um, Richard uh, got his academic credentials, but then he worked for a lifetime at the Agency for International Development and lived in many places in Africa and Central Asia. But the truth is that his main love, apart from his profession, were, was the subject of, of boats. You explained that to me. Um, I have to admit, although I live in Chicago, I'm not really much of a boat person. Uh, in fact, just hearing about him, he sounds like a very colorful personality. Uh, I have, as part of my work, I, I've done funerals, but as I mentioned to you, I and I've had people who were born, say, in the Soviet Union, or people who served in World War II, but I've never had anything quite like this. When you started describing all the places he worked, I felt after speaking to each of you I should get out a globe and uh, try and sort of figure out exactly where he lived. But the other thing that was you told me that I was new for me was his uh, love of boats. As early as 15, at the age of 15, he made, in the garage, he made a fiberglass boat, um, which he launched, which he launched. Uh, he always managed to get hold of a boat, and in fact, when he was growing up, um, there was one, uh, on Sunday nights, he might say to his parents, I'm going to the library. I'm going to the library. Um, I don't actually know of a library that's open on Sunday nights. And I don't think he did either. And I don't think your parents did either. He was actually going to the boat. The boat was his library. Um, and he might meet people there. He might. He had friends. He, in fact, he had adult as a as a as a teenager. He actually had adult friends. And he would go to the boat. He would. He work on it. Um, he uh, Amal, where's Amal? Oh, oh, there you are. Yeah, you and he met. You told me in in Cairo. Uh, you were you were teaching. You took your students for a six month stay in Cairo. You were the professor sponsor, and there was a houseboat on the Nile, which the Oriental Institute here in Chicago used for a meeting place. And he was stationed in Cairo, and you met there. And the rest is uh, a lovely history. Um, you lived, as you, or he lived, as you told me, in, well, you have Tunisia, Egypt, the Ivory Coast, Chad, Central Asia, T Tajikistan, Mozambique, incredible, as I said, incredible number of, of places. Um, growing up, you also told me that your parent, you, you were confirmed, all of you were confirmed, and no bar about mitzvah in those days in the synagogue you, you went to. And your parents went, they would go on a fr Friday night to uh, North Shore Congregation Israel. Uh, I'm, I know that some of you were greatly affected by the fact that your, your father uh, had a narrow escape, a miraculous escape, from Berlin in the late 30s. 
and uh, I'm sure it may it, it may well have affected him affected him too. The um, now Martha, I spoke to Martha and Charles, and you gave me slightly different stories. Where's Martha? Just a second. You gave me slightly different stories. So this has this matter has to be resolved now immediately. We'll have to take a vote on this. Uh, because Martha, you told me that he was a, and I quote, a prankster from the get-go. And Charles didn't have this memory. So I would suggest that you discuss this with each other. This is a very important matter. Um, don't, don't let it s sort of sit there, uh, <laughs> resol resolve this. Um, but once, on one occasion, you told me, Martha, that um, I think it, he brought in some drinks for guests of your parents, and he put some something coloured in it. So it's what colour was it again? Green. I put green in all the kids' milk, and for some strange reason, the children didn't want to drink it. it was quite, I think it was quite harmless, but um, but he, he got the desired effect. So, so there were the, there were these these episodes, um, and generally, you've told me that he was that he was well, he was very very bright, obviously, very smart. Um, he was easygoing. He, he was he was quiet. Sometimes it would be difficult to actually find out exactly what he what he was thinking, um, but he. He was someone who, who, well, when we think of one of the things that's remarkable about him is that he worked with the same organization for decades. It was a life's work. And it was a work, I think, of, of I involved some passion on his part. Uh, he was very, very concerned with this. I mean, that organization is an organization for helping people for helping people uh, or helping countries that need that need the um, that need this help uh, the word is aid when you when you talk, when you spoke to me about him and I was trying to get I was trying to get a picture of of the person that he he was um and there's uh, there, there was something fascinating about about him. I, I can't really explain. I can't really explain what it is. Uh, you have someone who, who who dedicates their life to something, but has this passion for 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 boats. I think you you live in Annapolis now, correct? And the reason is boats. Am I am I? And I, it's true, isn't it? It's true. Right. Yes. So, when we talk about religion, I mean, I'm, he, he had the Jewish religion, which he had an interesting relationship with, and maybe one that got stronger towards the end. But he had another religion, namely uh, a boat religion. <laughs> um, and that, that, was a, that was a passion, a passion too. Now, I think the early boats were quite small, right? I think they got larger as time went on, and um, in fact, you told me, Martha, when we were speaking, that he slept on the boat, and I said to you, because I'm very naive about these things, I said to you, wait a minute, was there anyone else on the boat? He said, no. He said, no. I said, well, the boat might bump into something, but you pointed out to me that it was, it was actually anchored, and then later on, later on, as he, as time went on, and he had more resources, so the, the boats the boats got larger. Sorry, just a little bit larger, not huge. We're not talking about the Queen Mary here. I, um, so, so this really, in a sense, was well. Amal, you were the love of his life. That's number one. Number two was boats, and number three was the Agency for International Development. I'm just wondering if anyone here has any has any memories of anything, anyone close or distant, that, that they'd like to uh, they'd like to offer. I know you said that no one wanted to actually give a speech, so I know, Martha, you're very worried that someone might say something that would be unkind. So, in deference to Martha, could you make your remarks kind, please? <laughs> yes. I, I would say please. 
can you heal here? Can you hear? Yeah. Yeah, good. Go ahead. Sorry. Really? That that's that's quite amazing. Yes. So so the memory of his parents' reaction to his flunking biology <laughs> was revived when he was when he uh, was revived about 60 years later and uh, he started studying it. Yes. You talked about it for 60 years. Yes. Oh, you did. Did you write to him and remind him of this all the time? No. Amal, did you know of this? Oh, you knew this. It's, fa it's, fam it's part of the family history. I see. But that, that is interesting as well. And that's actually s something wonderful. Because when you have an illness like that, which everyone knows is, is absolutely awful, um, an illness can, can dim one's interest in things outside of oneself. You, you know, when you get sick, uh, especially with something like that, you, you turn inward. You, you can only... It's very, you, you think of your own body, you know, and it, it's amazing if someone, for whatever reason he did it, he may have done it just to take himself out of himself, but it's still wonderful that, that, that he could do that. And also, that he actually had a passion, he had a passion and interest for learning, uh, from what I understand, from what you're saying. I mean, he may have done badly in biology. I mean, I wouldn't know about that because I went to a school in London where you were given a choice of certain subjects, and to my great joy at the age of 12, I was allowed to drop biology as one of the greatest days in my life. Um, so I understand him completely. I empathize totally because I can never stand the subject. And I don't think I'll be able to, even with good health, to ever try to study it again. So I, I am in awe of this. Um, does anyone else have anything? Because that, that's rather nice. That's rather lovely. Yes? No? Okay. So here we have this man, this very bright man uh, who uh, goes through life working all the time, conscientiously, uh, all over the world really, an organization that's there to help, to help countries that are worse off than we are, and to use his knowledge and his wonderful brains to do that. Uh, someone who, according to at least one account, as a child was a, was a prankster. Um, Charles, maybe we persuaded you, uh, and th and um, had this love love of of boats and of the people around him, and you know it's the thing is because of his because of his work, many of you even close to him would see him only at certain intervals, you know. So so you had you had this existence, and yet you 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 feel immeasurably close when we. When we spoke on the phone, I mean, we, I usually speak to people for about half an hour or something like that. We spoke for much longer uh, to both of you. And uh, to hear also that he, he was the, he's the child of someone who managed to escape from the Nazis. And many of his family did not. And that is also something that uh, those of us who are the children or even the grandchildren of people who, who, who managed to escape uh, to a certain extent carry carrying ourselves and it may have I would be quite sure that it did affect him either to a lesser or greater extent I don't know so that, that's also important to mention uh, we'd, um, uh, we are today is, the, is it the 25th today or the, tw it's the 25th the 27th in two days is uh, International Holocaust Memorial Day uh, not made such a big fuss of in this country, but in many other countries, in Britain and so on, it's the United Nations Day. So it, it's something that we should also think about uh, as we have a Jewish ceremony and we remember those who managed to escape from those who wish to make impossible, impossible what we are doing today and to make our lives impossible. So there's, we, we should feel a, a sadness, but also a, a gratitude that they failed in that and that in this particular case uh, their 
the failure of the Nazis leads to this to this family um, and that's something to think about too so I say of him may his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life that is what I say of him and to him I say Richard Lech b'shalom, gain freedom, gain peace. Have a lifting and aiding. May your repose be in paradise. You will never be forgotten. You will always be remembered in love by those who knew you and loved you and those who knew you and you loved. Amen. And now we're going to read the 23rd Psalm. If you open these little booklets, it's at the top of the page on the left. Would you read with me, please? The Lord is my shepherd, everyone. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Could I ask you to stand, please, if it's possible, if, if it's difficult for you to stand, stay seated. And could I ask those of you who are wearing the ribbons, if you could come and join me here, please. If you're wearing the ribbons, please, please come along. Okay, yes, I would normally come to you, but we're streaming this, so we want to be seen. So I'm going to cut the ribbons. Can you come a little closer, please? Yeah. Yeah, can you just push it up? Okay. I'm, going, I'm going to tear these ribbons, which are a sign of mourning. And could you just... Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. And the chance, yeah. Okay. So, yes, yeah, stay here because... Oopsie, this is a stubborn one. Was he stubborn? <laughs> <laughs> no. No, okay. so, not at all. Not at all. Okay, easy game. The well, only one. The only, the only one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm going to say a bracha, a blessing with you. It begins, Baruch HaTad, and I, you, know, you know that. that. So you'll say, it's not in there, no, it's not in there. But it's the blessing, but there's two words at the end, which you don't know, which I'll say with you. So begin. Baruch HaTad, Dayan, Ha-Emet. Ha-Emet. Which means, blessed be the two giants. That's what we say when we talk about the lost. If you like, we'll see if it remains there. Heil male rachamim, shochein bamromim, hametzei, menucha nechona, tachat kanefei ashina. Vemalot kadashim et harim, kezorak yam asirim, et nishma'at. Richard Mark, Ben Stephen, and Josephine, shalach lola mahal, vavut shanach nor nitzdaka, biyad, askarat nishma'atau, begane ahedem. To him and Uchato Lachin Barachamim Yastirehu Pesate can offer of Liolamim Vietzer or Bitzer Hamet Nishmato Adonai Hu Nahalato Vianuach Bishalom and Nishkavo Venomar Amen. Compassionate God, eternal spirit of the universe, grant perfect rest in your sheltering presence among the holy and pure who shines the brightness of the firmament under the soul of Richard Mark Frankel, the daughter, the son of Stephen and Josephine, who has entered eternity and in whose memory we offer charity. May his repose be in paradise. O God of mercy, let him find refuge in your eternal presence and let his soul be bound up in the bond of everlasting life. God is his inheritance. May he rest in peace and let us say, Amen.
This does conclude the service in the chapel. The interment will take place at Shalom Memorial Park at 1700 West Rand Road in Arlington Heights, approximately 10 minutes in procession. The procession will be forming in our parking lot. Please keep in mind a few safety features while in the procession. Keep your bright headlights on at all times. Put your emergency blinkers on. Attach the orange funeral sticker to the passenger portion of your front windshield. And we will also attach a flag to the roof of your car. And please stay as close as safety permits to the car in front of you. The following people have been selected to serve as pallbearers. When I call your name, please come forward. Peter Rubinitz, Robert Rubinitz, Michael McLinn, Ken Raffi, and Sal Torkelson. At this time, I would ask that everyone please rise as the family and the rabbi are escorted from the chapel. Paul Bears, you're going to follow this gentleman right here. Right behind, right behind. We're going to follow behind. Two by two, we're going to follow behind you. Okay. So before someone gets in the doors. Now we'll have the family come this way. 